hi welcome <laughs> so in this video i'm going to be going through all of the basics about pottery everything that you need to know before you start because i just get so many questions about pottery and how it works and what is needed and all of those kind of things so i thought i would make a full video explaining everything in one place if you do have any questions after this video still please feel free to leave them in the comments to start with we're going to start at the really really beginning which is clay i'm going to start with the different types of clay because that completely affects the stuff that you make how it will turn out the difficulty level all of those kind of things you get a variety of different types of clay you get earthenware stoneware porcelain paper clay, air dry clay, there's quite a few. So these different types of clay has different functionalities and difficulties and will have an overall different look once fired. There are also different subcategories within each type of clay. So different colors and like coarseness of the clay. I will give a brief explanation about each one. So to start with earthenware, earthenware is a very delicate clay it's used more for decorative items it's also more porous so it doesn't work well for food or drink items or things that need to be waterproof like a vase it's more for decorative items and um, the more delicate yeah, pieces then you get stoneware stoneware is what you use for functional pieces because it is the most durable um, the most the least porous a great type of clay to work with clay to use for dinnerware um, mugs bowls plates um, and then vases and things like that so yeah stoneware is definitely the clay that i would suggest you start with just because there's such a wide variety of things that you can make with it um, and it's a nice clay to work with porcelain is a very very fine clay you can get it very very thin and detailed but the thing about porcelain it's a very difficult clay to work with um, and it's also very expensive as a beginner as i said i suggest sticking to stoneware for now obviously experiment with different types and um but i think for your first batch i would suggest stoneware you also get paper clay which is an easy clay to work with and then air dry clay which does not need to get fired as i mentioned before um, you get different colors of clay you get terracotta you get a very dark brown clay you get white clay and then even still within these colors of clay there's variations some has a little bit more of a yellow tinge to it some has a little bit more of a white they usually have a um, color guide where you can see exactly how the clay will fire and then on top of that you also get different fine or coarseness to the clay so you can get a fine clay or you can get uh, a coarse clay which is very like gritty then again these different clays have different functionalities so the fine clay is what you would use for more delicate wear so mugs um, plates bowls and then the gritty coarse clay is used for pieces that you want to make that are going to be bigger or wider and it needs to hold itself up. The thing about the coarse clay is that it's got grit in which makes it stronger in the end. It holds it together more so when you're making an item that goes wider for example it has more strength in itself to hold itself up rather than flop. So that's the different types of clay. Okay what's next? Let me get my book. You better not run out of battery. Okay, so now you know about the clay. Now we're going to talk about the stages of clay or the clay dryness. So when you get your clay, you're going to get it in a plastic bag and it will be at plastic stage. Plastic basically just means that it is moldable and free it forms and stuff from it. Just a quick side note, um, you're going to get it in a plastic bag. You need to make sure that this bag is sealed all the time because if it's not, you're clay will dry out and then become not workable because yeah it'll be too dry so you have plastic clay you make your item leave it to dry for a little bit it depends on the moisture level in the air but it can take, be from like a few hours to a day or two um, you just need to keep checking back on your piece but leave it to dry for a little bit until it becomes 
um, hard enough to pick up without it deforming but still soft enough that you can carve away at it at this stage it's called leather hard this is the perfect stage for trimming your piece um, or carving patterns into it then you leave this piece to dry even more um, for quite a long time until it is super super dry and this is called bone dry bone dry means that there's absolutely no moisture in your clay which is very important because if you get your piece fired when it has not fully dried yet um, there's a chance of there being a little bit of moisture in there um, and it exploding in the kiln so you need to make sure that your piece is bone dry before taking it in to be fired okay next i'm going to be talking about the ceramic process so explaining exactly what you need to do and when and how everything works get your clay you make your item and you let it dry until it's bone dry when it's bone dry this is called green wear now take your green wear into the bisque fired this raises it up to a certain temperature to strengthen it a bit but it isn't as high of a temperature that it needs to get so we're strengthening the piece a bit just for glaze to be able to stick to it and for you to paint on and things like that so once it has been bisque fired this is then called bisque wear now you take your bisque wear and you can paint on it and you can glaze on it you can paint on green wear it's not suggested just because bisque wear gives a much better quality and shows the colors a bit better and it's also less risky to paint on bisque wear just because green wear is very very delicate so if you handling this piece and painting on it it's more likely to break okay so now that you've got your bisque wear and you've painted and glazed it or done whatever you like um, you take it in to get glaze fired when i say take it in I mean if you don't own a kiln uh, which I'm guessing most people who are watching this don't own a kiln I don't own a kiln so when I say take it in to be fired I mean go to your nearest pottery supply store or a pottery studio near you that offers firing services also check if they offer glaze services otherwise you'll need to glaze yourself but I'll get into more glaze about glaze later on Take your bisque wear in to be glaze fired. Once you collect that item, that is then called a ceramic. As a quick example, I've got here a freshly made piece of green wear. It's been dried but hasn't been fired yet. And then this has been obviously made, dried, bisque fired, glazed, glazed fired, and now it's a ceramic piece of ceramic. Just to show you an example. This is a finished piece, this is a freshly made piece. Just a quick side note, your piece does shrink from when you make your piece to when it gets fired. The general rule of thumb, if I'm not mistaken, is that it shrinks at about 10%. It shrinks slightly when it dries and then it shrinks again when it gets fired. So just keep this in mind when you make your piece. Okay, the next thing I'm going to be talking about is different methods. The two obvious methods are hand building and throwing. So hand building is when you're making an item using your hands, either pinching or joining items together, which is what you would mostly see in my videos. And then throwing is when you are making pottery on a wheel. Now with hand building, there are a few different methods used. You get pinch pot method, slab method, and coil method. Pinch pot method is when you take a ball of clay and you stick your thumb in the middle and you pinch around to create walls or a piece like that. This is generally used for mugs or bowls, um, that kind of general shape. Slab method is when you roll out slabs of clay cut out shapes from that and then attach those pieces together to create a form. Coil method is when you roll out coils and you place that on top of each other and blend together to create a form. I would like to take a quick moment to thank our first sponsor. It feels so surreal saying that and I'm so happy about it but more than anything I think it could help you guys a lot as well. So, 
Thank you to Clay King for sponsoring this video. They are a pottery supply store based in the US, but they do ship internationally. You can get everything that you need from there. You can buy items online on their website. They also have physical stores. They stock everything you need from clay to glazers to tools, um, even kilns and pottery wheels so definitely definitely check them out make sure to use my discount code wendy5 for five dollars off orders over fifty dollars and then wendy10 for ten dollars off orders over hundred dollars i'll put their website link and my discount codes in the description below make sure to check them out so if you're based in the us or just want to buy from them internationally please make sure to use my code to get the discount and that'll also help me out a lot. So thank you to Clay King for sponsoring this video. A very common question that I get asked is what type of paint to use on ceramics. So that brings me into the next segment, which is underglazing. When you are painting on your piece, on your bisqueware, make sure you use underglazing. Underglazing is a specific type of paint, specifically for ceramics. Uh, if you use normal paint, it'll just burn off in the kiln because uh, it gets fired to such a high temperature, a lot of things just burn away. Um, so you need to use specific products for ceramics. You can find underglazing at your pottery supply store. It works exactly like normal paint, it's the same consistency and you use a paintbrush to paint it onto your pieces. Make sure to paint about two to three layers if you want a solid color. If you are wanting to see your brush strokes, paint one layer. If you want a more watercolor effect, mix a little bit of water into your underglaze. It also works exactly like normal paint with creating other colors so you can mix two colors to create another color you can mix blue and yellow to make green for example just bear in mind a very important thing about underglazing is that it will change shade or color in the kiln it's not exactly like paint where what you put on is what you get you paint it on once it gets fired it will change the shade so just bear this in mind when you do buy your underglaze and when you mix the underglazes together that what you are seeing is not exactly what you'll be getting out. So it is a tricky thing about the painting side of things. That's where a lot of experimenting comes in and why a lot of people do test tiles. For example, I have some underglaze over here. This looks like quite a brownie mustard kind of yellow, but it turns out a lot more bright. In the pottery supply store there should be a color guide where it shows exactly what the color will look like once fired so when you are choosing color make sure to refer back to the color guide to see exactly what you are buying so that's under glazes now we're going into glazes under glaze and glaze are two very different things under glaze is the paint that you use to paint on patterns Glaze is the product that you put over your piece to finish it off. Either give it a glossy effect, a specific color. You get a lot of different types of glazes. Get a lot of different colors, um, different glossiness levels, all of those kind of things. Um, but I'll just go over the basics. Just to show you an example. So the difference between underglaze. You can see there those flowers painted on is underglaze i painted them on and then it's got a transparent glaze over the whole thing so once the glaze is put on your whole item and it gets fired it basically melts and sticks to the surface and creates kind of like a glass layer over your whole item which makes it waterproof food safe if you're using a food safe glaze just keep that in mind yeah it just gives it a nice finish you don't have to glaze if you are not using it for a food purpose or needs it to be waterproof and you like the effect of a non-glazed piece, that's fine. You still need it to get a glazed fired to the highest temperature that it needs to go. Here's another example of a glazed piece. You get a dip in glaze and then you get a brush on glaze. Dip in glaze 
is when you have glaze in like a bucket for example and you dip your whole piece in that liquid and it dries onto the surface. Brush on glaze is more of a paint texture where you physically brush on the glaze onto the surface. This is an example of a brush on glaze. You can see in there it's the same as a paint consistency. Again, glaze changes color in the kiln so whatever you buy and whatever you paint on will look different once you get it back from being fired. Um, so make sure to look at the color guide to know exactly what it will fire to before you buy. For example, this glaze over here is kind of like a light purple, you can see there, and that fires to be a dark blue. This glaze, the light purple, turns out to look like this. Glaze does change quite a lot, so just keep that in mind. The other really cool thing about glazes is that you can layer them. You can layer different colors on top of each other um, in different patterns and effects and it will fire to be a slightly different effect or color and these are available at Clay King along with many other options of glaze. Again so many different varieties of glaze and effects and colors that um, you can get which is why so many people experiment with lots of different things and make textiles there's just a lot a lot a lot that you can do the other thing about glaze is that it'll have a different effect if you're putting it onto a smooth surface compared to a textured surface this piece here has been carved away and then glaze over it it's the same glaze as this but as you can see on the ridges it doesn't catch Okay, and then lastly, a few tips and tricks. Obviously, there's a lot more than this, but I'm just going to say a few. Use a damp sponge to smooth down the surface. It's best to do this when it's leather hard because then there's no risk in deforming the shape, but it will just smooth up all the impurities on the surface. Make sure to work on a non-stick surface. A few examples of non-stick surfaces is untreated wood, canvas, um, or material and plaster. Lastly, keep your area clean. This is mainly because dry clay and the dust particles is really bad to breathe in for your lungs. Make sure you clean your area afterwards um, to make sure that there's no clay left behind that will dry up and get in the air if that makes sense. If you are sanding down a dried piece of clay um, for impurities or anything, make sure to wear a proper mask so that you don't breathe that dust in because like I said before, it's really bad for you. So yeah, just look after your health. Okay, so that's a very basic overview of the whole process and explaining each stage. Um, as I said, before there is so much more to it and a lot of experimenting needs to be done to find what you enjoy and what you like um but yeah the only way to find that out is just to start if you know me i am not a big talker so i feel exhausted right now <laughs> but yeah i can really talk for hours about pottery but if you have any questions whatsoever please leave them in the comments or even message me on instagram and i am more than happy to answer them and i really hope this helped you a lot and answered a few of the questions that you had and even inspired you to start making pottery at home i'll put my instagram handle it's clay.ceramics.sa obviously you're on my youtube <laughs> please like and subscribe it helps a lot more than you think and it's a cheap and easy way to support me thanks for watching and i'll see you next time bye <laughs> tired there was a lot of talking man